work at a small company in Oslo, Norway, doing small talk. Uh, I've worked there since I've finished university. So uh, today I'm going to talk to you about two issues, uh, well, not issues, but topics which reason, which often bothers me when I uh, both read the mailing list and uh, see issues. And also they're not discussed very often. So I think they're quite important. One of them is uh, encodings. And the other is optimization. And uh, those of you who can tell me what's wrong with that statement is free to leave the first part. Anyone? OK, then you have something to learn, so that's good. So encodings, what, what are encodings? They're a way to map characters into bytes. That's basically it. There's many ways to do it, and the uh, traditional ways still causes problems. Um, why are encodings important? Because, like I said, problems related to them pop up every, every week almost. And they're also uh, important every time you speak with an external system. So when you leave Smalltalk, you need to pay attention to them. So every time you access files, every time you use FFI, every time you talk to a database, stuff like that. And that's, uh, that's the why you should care about encodings. And the thing about encodings is that they're not hard. They're easy as long as you know them and remember, keep them in mind, because they will cause trouble later on if you don't keep them in mind from the start. Um, and um, an important part of uh, dealing with encodings is knowing what, what the external system that you're talking to expect you to talk to them in. <laughs> I can't really start talking to you guys in Norwegian because you wouldn't understand me. And it's the same with encodings, uh, most of them at least. And. Uh, you also need to handle it consistently. If you don't, you'll be in a mess in no time. If you have no plan for dealing with encodings uh, and you just store some bytes and hope, hope everything will be OK, you'll be in trouble in no time. So, But how do we make it easy? Well, the first thing you run into when you, you start to learn about encodings is that there are lots of, lots of concepts and, and names which are <laughs> ill-defined, de ill um, so it's hard to talk about encodings in a consistent way with others. Um, these are collected from the Unicode report, which uh, tries to establish a common vocabulary. Um, and um, the character repertoire is basically, a character is an abstract entity. I mean, it, it maps to some, some symbol which has meaning for people, right? So. A character repertoire is just a collection of uh, of symbols that you want to be able to express, and that's that's basically it. Yep. And a character map usually maps those abstract entities, th those characters, into into um, numbers. So for most, most parts, uh, this is a legacy concept, which was usually used when you map them all the way down, across all layers, from the abstract down to the bytes. So you had the one-to-one -one mapping between the characters in your character repertoire and the bytes you saved to disk. So stuff like uh, code pages in, on Windows. Those are character maps. Um, coded character sets is, um, well, <laughs> it's sort of the same as a character map. Um, but uh, yeah, I think you could say those two are quite equivalent. And then you have uh, the character encoding, which is the mapping from uh, well, not, not really, though. Character sets maps them to, to uh, a constant entity. Like, say, um, you want 32 bytes, 
uh, you need 32 bytes, then, then you have a common mapping from the, the, the integers into, into the bytes, right? And that's, that's, that's uh, the difference between them. Um, and it's <laughs> a bit hard to, to differentiate because for many, many types of encodings, a lot of these layers are, uh, are equivalent. Um, and the character encoding itself, um, these are basically reversible uh, terms for re reversible operations from a char coded character set into the actual bytes that you store. So you, you may have an abstract entity of 32 bits, uh, I mean four bytes, but then you want to map it into something that you actually store to, to disk because you don't always want your coded character set to, to use four, four bytes per character. So that's basically how you do uh, UTF-16, UTF-8, stuff like that. Because your uh, coded character set is, is equivalent to, to a 32-bit uh, character. Yep, and uh, when it comes to file systems, it's kind of hard when it comes to naming in, in file systems. On Windows, there's... Uh, actually a consistent way to encode character names, I mean file names. Um, it used to be that everything was stored in, in the current code page of the, of the local system. Uh, that was until Windows 98, so I think it's safe to say that it's obsolete by now. Um, and what Windows does is they always store them in UTF-16 uh, uh, encoding, which is um, a bit of a, a strange one. Um, so Unicode defines code points for characters. That's the uh, uh, coded character sets, right? And um, in Unicode, you have a uh, maximum of 22 bytes bits used, I think, yeah, out of the 32. So it's a limited range, but you can't map all of it into 16 bytes. 16 bits, <laughs> two bytes. So UTF-16 is a bit of a misnomer because uh, UTF-16 can encode the entire Unicode range. That means you need an escape character, which, which tells you that the next, the next character I'm going to, to present to you does not fit into two bytes. So it's not a fixed byte size encoding. Um, which is important, has some important properties, right? Because the string of the length is just the amount of bytes divided by uh, an even some number. So it's easy to get the length of the string and you can easily access at any arbitrary index because it's a constant of offset times the amount you want to, to access it. And UTF-16 doesn't have that, that characteristic. So it's sort of a sort of a failed attempt, <laughs> really, at uh, providing a, a good way of storing Unicode characters. Most characters will store in two bytes, but uh, you can't be certain, so uh, you neither have a fixed byte set or, or efficient encoding, because every character is two bytes. Even the Unicode characters from, I mean the ASCII characters from 0 to 127. Um, but anyways, at least Windows is consistent in the way it handles file names. Unix has no standard for how to handle file names. For Unix, file names is just a sequence of bytes. And uh, that's a problem when you want to try to display them anywhere, really. Uh, so in recent years, uh, most, most uh, Frontends which actually store files have uh, have uh, coalesced on using UTF-8 to store them in, and uh, the reasons for that is that in most old systems they will display correctly, right? Because UTF-8 encodes its character in bytes uh, the same way for the ASCII range, which is zero to one twenty-seven, um, which which means that for English text, uh, file names will display properly on old systems as well. And uh, it's also easily to, 
validate whether a string is UTF-8 because in UTF-8, uh, if your first, if, if, if a character is above 127, then it indicates a multibyte character. And uh, the different byte lengths of, of, a, of a character have different values. <coughs> so you can basically check each bit of the, the, the upper uh, four bits to check, uh, to check how many, uh, how many uh, bytes are actually part of this, uh, this character. So it's, it's very easy and very fast to create a reader uh, for UTF-8 into something else, which is usually appropriate uh, internally in an application. Because in an application, you, you usually, you want, I mean, constant uh, at accesses to strings. The way Faro does it internally is uh, not horrible, actually. <laughs> Contrary to what you might think. Um, what it does is it defines two, two string classes. You have, a, you have a byte string and you have a wide string. And uh, a wide string stores characters in four bytes. And a byte string stores character in one, in one byte each. And the encoding used for uh, byte strings is UTF-8859-1. And uh, I mean ISO. Eight eight five nine dash one, and the nice property of eight eight five nine dash one is that the byte values in it, uh, if you translate them to integers, they map directly to the Unicode code code uh, abstract code value. So it's very easy when uh, when you need to display a string, for example, uh, with a Unicode aware font, then. You don't need to do any conversion from your byte format uh, into code points in Unicode to display a byte string. So that's that's why we use uh, 8859-1 internally for that. And um, the wide strings, yeah, they're basically UTF-32. So you simply store; it, they have the same property as uh, as as the byte strings in that. If you take their value as an integer, it's the Unicode code point. So they make make it easy to, to display it correctly, um, which is actually a quite big deal. <laughs> so back to back to um, Unix and the file names. Like I said, th there is no standard. But if you write files to a Unix system, write them in UTF-8. Because most likely it will display correctly. It's easy to detect if it's, it's, a, it's a valid file name, I mean a valid UTF-8 file name. And um, you also have uh, much more, uh, much less frustration when, uh, when trying to read things in again. So, let's move on to FFI. And uh, the thing about encoding here is that uh, whenever you pass a string to, to a DLL, you never know what the DLL does with it. So, if it does any kind of processing on it, then the encoding is important. And it can vary from library to library which encoding the, the, it, it expects to receive its strings in. So, the th one thing you do not want to do is just pass pass byte strings from Faro into an FFI call, or wide strings for that matter. Because in some cases, it will be wrong. Uh, 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 okay. And um, on Unix Max, it's, uh, it's standard that uh, the encoding for libraries are, is UTF-8. For these are system libraries. You never know with uh, with the custom libraries or or something you've coded yourself. Well, you know for something you coded yourself, but something your friend coded, or you know that you don't know what you expect, and that's that's important as well. 
Um, so you need to, to know on a case-by-case -case basis which encoding to pass your strings in when you talk to library. And that's why you can't do this in the FFI interface itself. You can't automatically translate a, a, par, a string from Paro into something that any arbitrary uh, library can understand. Um, so, how do we convert strings in in, in Faro into uh, into a format? I thought I'd uh, do a short demo of that. Does anybody know what the text converters are? No. So this is why I have lots of things, right? I never close them. I just open a new one because I can't find the old one. Um, <laughs> yeah. The text converter um, takes an internal string and then convert it, converts it to, to bytes in an encoding. The, uh, the strange thing about this is that uh, it actually encodes it into another byte string. It doesn't encode it into a byte array. So when you use the text converters to, to read from FFI, you need to uh, return uh, a char array and then, well, uh, a char data type for, for the external function because that will be automatically converted by the FFI into a byte string. And then you can convert that byte string to, uh, to, an intern to the internal encoding. Dun, dun, dun. And uh, you can see there's lots of encoding, different encoding conversion converters here, which, as far as I'm aware, all correct work correctly. So, yeah, question. You can't well internally in Faro. I mean, encoding doesn't make any sense internally in Faro. I, I, I'm saying that uh, the way we represent them in bytes is the same way as ISO 8859-1 and uh, UTF-32 does it. But in, in Faro you just have characters. I mean, so, so the characters have a Unicode value. And everything in Faro, and Squeak for the matter, is, is Unicode. So... Um, we sort of shortcut the entire thing by abstracting away the concept of uh, how they're actually stored. Well, mostly. You don't care about encoding until you don't understand the math. That's right. Well, if you do it correctly, you don't. But if you, for example, misuse the text converters and start converting one internal byte string into a byte string of another uh, encoding and then start pass passing that instance around, then, then you're in trouble. So. You should never, ever, ever do that. Uh, Harry, when, when you do the text co co converter, yeah. the text converter uh, will give you like, like an input, a byte string, and it can convert to using certain encoding, and also... Uh, uh, it, it depends on, if, if you convert uh, to the encoding of the text converter, then the input can be a wide string or a byte string, ah. because I mean, the source is an internal string. <coughs> but if you convert from something, then, then it needs to be a byte object. Um, I'm not sure if it works actually works with byte arrays, but uh, when you do convert to from an internal string, then it returns a, a byte string. So um, there are two uh, utility methods on string, which you should only use if you either leave or enter the system. And that's uh, convert from with, with the converter and convert to with converter. These are the simplest ways of, uh, of, uh, of doing it. So you have a string and uh, you say convert from 
with <laughs> yeah convert from with converter and then the the converter of of the uh, of the encoding that the bytes that you want to uh, to decode I mean so uh, or the other way around with convert to so convert to changes um, the encoding of an internal string to the en encoding of, of the encoder that you pass as an argument. Convert from does the opposite. So it assumes that you have, uh, have a string with some encoding that is not the internal string encoding, and that you want to convert it into the internal encoding using the provided c converter. So that's, that's really all there is to it in Paro. Everything internally is consistent. When you leave or enter the system, you use these. And if you write to a file, the default converter on the file stream is a UTF-8 encoder. And you can set, set it specifically if, if you're talking to, if you're importing data files uh, in a known format from uh, uh, yeah, from from some known source, which which you already know the encoding of. Um, and if you get um, UTF-8 invalid UTF-8 error when you try to read from a, from a, from a file, then you need to figure out its encoding before you read it. Don't just randomly change it into ISO 8859-1 or converter or or something like that. Because if, if you read it wrong, and you're most probably going to do that, if you just do it randomly, then, then you're in trouble. Because you think you have a correct string internally, and you don't. Or the string that the uh, program was meant to, <coughs> was meant to tell you. Yep, let's go back to the slides. Yes, we were talking about FFI. <laughs> so, let's move on to d databases for a minute. If you talk to a database, they each have their own way of uh, telling you what their, their encoding is, I believe. I only know the way that you, you get it for oracles. So, But I can't imagine anybody else being this intricate. <laughs> so. Um, on a machine where you want to connect to an Oracle database, you need the Oracle client, right? Unless you write a native client, which I'm not sure if you're allowed to do. But um, the client, uh, Oracle client, fetches a setting stored in the MSL Lang uh, environment variable, both on Unix and Windows and everywhere. And um, the format of that string is um, the locale followed by the encoding. And the locale determines things like what is my separator character, for example. If you want to store numbers in the database, you need to know the locale of the machine you're storing them from. Because the, the um, client will assume that you pass them uh, for numbers formatted like the locale would do. And uh, the encoding is the second part. And uh, it's sort of annoying with Oracle, because Oracle has a lot of custom, customly defined encodings. And um, they don't always necessarily map into what you would expect them to, to map into. So for example, UTF-8, if you find that in an Oracle NSL lang, it's not UTF-8. What you expect to be UTF-8 is AL32 UTF-8. So in order to, to, to see the difference between them, you have to consult Oracle documentation and see if, in your case, it's OK to almost get it right. Um, if, if you have multiple Oracle homes installed, for example, then uh, each, each of the homes can have different encoding uh, settings. And then they're stored in the registry on Windows. I'm not sure how it works on, on Linux and Unix. 
and that will be used if the NSLang is not present. The NSLang always overrides everything else. And uh, from Oracle Client version 8 or something, you can also set them manually with FFI calls. So you can tell them, I'm going to pass you strings in this encoding. Please, please convert them to the encoding of the database. And of course, setting NSL, NLS lang to, for example, UT, AL32 UTF-8 won't help you if, if the database that the client is talking to does not have a Unicode uh, character set, uh, a character set which covers the entire Unicode range. So you can still do everything correctly and still get errors when you, when you try to insert it into the database. So it's a lot of things to, to, to get right when you talk to databases. And uh, unless it's abstracted away from you uh, by some abstract interface, then, uh, then you have to figure out how, how, how each one does it on a case-to-case -case basis, really. Um, and this is, just, this is just an example of how intricate it can be to actually get the right encoding that you're supposed to pass a string to, uh, pass a string in. But you still need to do it <laughs> if you don't want an error later or customers complaining that their, their uh, applications don't store the data that you told them to and stuff like that. So, a bit of coding time. What we're going to do is go back to this um, example. Oh, I sort of forgot to mention. Uh, I hope most of you were here on Monday and made... Uh, the uh, image with uh, with uh, the VM maker loaded because that also includes the FFI libraries. So uh, if you want, you can open up that uh, you can open up that uh, that image and uh, follow along. Can anybody now tell me what what is wrong with this 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 function with using this function? Nobody? Okay. Yeah? That's right, and that's why um, you call it twice, this function. Um, well, that's, that's already done in, in the example code, because if, if, yeah. if, the, if the arguments except the name is nil, then, then you get the size of the uh, uh, environment variable back. So you use that in a second call to the function. But that's, that's not exactly what I was talking about. Um, Yeah, that's right. And um, like I said, Windows libraries. Hmm? Yeah, it's it's a character array of bytes, right? And when you use it from Faro, um, the example function, it uh, it looks like this. So it just gives in a byte string and tells it to put put your bytes in me and and I'll 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 just return that string. Is that the error? That's the error because the encoding will be incorrect for that string if you don't have ASCII uh, environment variables. So the special thing about uh, Windows is I, I talked about. Uh, like uh, in, in legacy formats, they, they tended to use uh, the code page of the system. And uh, if you consult the Windows API, then uh, you will only see this entry. And the prepended A stands for, uh, uh, 
what's it called? ANSI, I think. And it's, it's, it's the legacy function which, which will return you the string in the code page. So in most cases, it will look correct, right? Because the code page on Windows, if you're in Western Europe, is uh, uh, MS1252, which is almost the same as Latin 1, which is the internal uh, encoding in, in, uh, in Faro. But if you try to, pos to posit a wide string as, as parameter, of course it will fail. And uh, if you have any characters outside the basic range of, of, um, of um, MS-1252, it will simply discard them. So you won't get the correct value, which is actually stored in the Windows, reg the Windows environment, just using this like it's, it's done here. So um, the first thing to do oops, is do this. The W stands for wide and means that you use the uh, Windows API, which is uh, Unicode compatible. And the encoding of strings in that, that variant of the functions, like I, I said before, is, is UTF-16. So uh, every, every string you pass in, like the name, needs to be UTF-16. And everything you get back, like the, uh, like the buffer here, needs to be converted back from UTF-16. And how do we do that? Well, it's quite simple. We start with our argument string, and we convert it to the encoding of the system converter. And the system converter is the UTF-16 text converter. And on Windows, you use little endian encoding for UTF-16 as strings. So UTF-16 string is, is the string of our name, which we want to, to fetch from the registry, uh, the environment. And that you can safely use. And uh, if you do have the environment variable, you will get the size in UTF-16 characters. Uh, I mean, not in, yeah, well, I'm confusing myself here. In, in UCS2 code points, and UCS2 is, yeah, well, in double bytes, you could say. So in half, half words, yeah. So, so the size here will be the amount of 16-byte uh, characters that are needed to, to store the, uh, the envi environment variable. <coughs> so, how do we do that? Well, we hack it. We create a new byte string, byte size, which is a uh, byte string, which is uh, of the return size multiplied by two, because the byte string is, of course, one byte per, per element. And then we use that as the buffer. Um, and to return it in the internal encoding, we need to convert it back. So this buffer, which is a byte string, we convert back with, uh, with the UTF-18 converter. And the reason I've added um, a zero at the end here is that uh, I'm not sure how if, if the FFI only adds a single null terminating character or, uh, or more. So, um, Yeah, yeah. Just add a new character to the. Uh, no, no. Uh, I I add it first I mean for the main. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the size returned here is also the size with the null terminating byte. So you have to discard the last byte if you want the uh, correct internal string. Hmm. Yeah, last character. In this case, it is byte, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we've already converted it back to, to an internal byte string. Or, or a wide string, if that's the correct answer. So uh, after that, there's only one, one terminating character. <laughs> so. What can we do with this? Well, 
let's uh, look at my environment variables. I've got the test here, which is uh, the euro. That's a Norwegian character, by the way. Um, so if we try first to, to just get the euro using the, the, um, the standard function, then uh, it won't print correctly. As you can see here, when you use the, the uh, code page, then uh, is the same in uh, in uh, in MS twelve fifty two, which is my uh, local uh, locale, and and um, ISO eight eight five nine dash one. So the ER still displays correctly, and that's why it can take some time to to realize that you have some errors, and by that time you usually already have invalid bytes in your image. So if you don't think about this up front it's much, much harder to fix because you already have invalid data. And with, uh, let's see, did I change the font back? I don't think so, I hope not. Yeah. And there we get the correctly stored. And the nice thing about this is um, the euro sign is a wide character because we use the Unicode code point, right? And the code point is 8,364. So if we try to, to get the variable uh, using the old function, then we'll have an error because uh, the FFI doesn't know how to convert wide strings into a character uh, array, uh, which it shouldn't. But if we use the wide version, where uh, the euro sign is first converted into UTF-16, then we get the euro sign back, which is correct. And um, I've also included uh, a fun little case called supplementary, which is um, a three, well, yeah, three byte encoded UTF-16 character. No, I mean four byte encoded UTF-16 character. So it's in, in the range that can't be covered by, uh, by a, a single 16 byte character. 16 uh, bit, I, sorry. And it uh, looks okay on Windows. It uh, probably won't on, uh, on Faro because I don't have the correct fonts installed at the moment. Well, maybe I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> so, if we print this, we can see that we got the correct value from the registry, uh, the environment. And if you use A, then um, all hell breaks loose. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you're going to get a random byte string of three characters. Oops. It was just called. Oh, two, actually. Yeah. But, anyways, it's not correct, <laughs> which is what we want. So that is how you call system functions on Windows. And uh, you actually have the equivalent example for, um, for, uh, for, um, for lin Linux here. So if we let look at this image, I have a uh, uh, yeah. I have a test here, which, uh, oh, you can't? Okay, at least. That doesn't work, right? No? no. Damn it. <laughs> okay, yep. Mm -hmm. Do I have a text editor open? 
have power open. That works. So that's my uh, environment variable in uh, in uh, in Mac OS X. <coughs> and if we do the um, the old version, then we get three bytes. The thing about um, the let let in one character set the um, I'm let in one and uh, ISO eight eight five nine dash one are equivalent by the way when I when I use them. The thing about them is that every character in it uh, is encoded on a single extended page in, in Unicode. So so all the all the um, Unicode values of the characters are uh, well. I mean in UTF. Wait, how is that again? Yeah, never mind. Uh, uh, uh. But anyways, we can see that it's um, it's in some other encoding, right? Because we didn't get the back. You're going to get that if you if you try to pass a byte string as an argument, because the FFI doesn't know how to convert a byte string to a byte string, right? Okay, That's okay. Sometimes is the answer. I, I do FFI and failing and failing and failing. I'm like, maybe it's encoding. Is that a reasonable um, No, well, it could be. I mean, like in this example, if, if I'd used the Windows API here, um, and... Yeah. Yeah, but but uh, but if if your issue is with the wide string, then um, then it will fail before you get an external call failed because external call failed is uh, then you're already in the primitive. If you try to do that, then the FFI will tell you an error before. I, I can't convert what you told me into a valid argument. It will stop before, that. It will stop before you get a primitive failed. Okay. So if I get the external call failed, it is not an No, uh, you'll get this, actually. Okay. Well, never mind. <laughs> you do get the external call failed. But the error, OK, the error. If you get could not coerce. Arguments. It says external call fail. It says could not coerce arguments. But it's it's not yeah, but it returned an error code, right? Okay. And the error code was could not coerce arguments. So if that's the error call of the error code of the primitive failed, then then it's probably passing wide strings into something which doesn't uh, doesn't. Uh, Except them. Variable word. So you could you could have uh, yeah. And the thing is, they're 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 kind of sneaky because. If, for example, you, you uh, call this um, W value uh, version without converting it to UTF-16, then, I mean, you simply won't find it in the registry, right? Because there are no invalid UTF-16 characters, like there is UTF-8. But So it, it could be encoding problems. It could also be lots of other things. <laughs> So on Mac, it's uh, it's simpler, right? Because um, all we do is is uh, convert it to UTF-8 and then convert it back again. There's no no need to allocate different types of uh, buffers and stuff like that. Uh, 
just, just use the return value instead. Yeah. And SSI copy you can Yeah. So um, that way it's a bit more convenient than, than what you have to do on Windows because that's the common convention on Windows that uh, they never allocate strings for you. You have to pass everything as arguments and allocate them yourself. So, yeah, let's do this one. And it returns the correct, correct string from the, from the environment. Of course, encoding this into UTF-8, uh, that is the argument here, uh, test, takes almost no time, right? Because it is UTF-8. There's no non-ASCII characters here. And for UTF-8, the ASCII characters are the same as the UTF-8 bytes. So converting it just returns a copy. That's, that's uh, what the converter does. But, uh, but on Windows, when you have to convert to UTF-16, it could, uh, could turn into some overhead. But it's better than just getting errors, at least in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. So. That's also why if, if you see an FFI library which expects you to call the, uh, call the primitive functions, or, well, the, the functions defining the primitives directly, and do not encapsulate them, you shouldn't use it, really. Because you run into problems like this, and they'll be hard, hard to fix. Unless you want to use the old function defining a primitive as a wrapper and extract the primitive itself. <laughs> yep, so that was actually the, the answer to the first question. <laughs> the A here. is what is fundamentally wrong about this FFI call. Because in order to have it work correctly with A, first of all, you need to know the system locale, the system code page, um, which... How to know how to convert to that page and back. Yes, and you need to know how to convert to that code page and back. And for some of the code pages, there are converters. Like 1252, there is actually a converter. But... Um, for many of them, you won't be able to find one already. And uh, it's also more limited than what you can do with the, the wide version, right? And you already know how to convert to and from the string format expected by, by, uh, by that version. So you're basically limiting yourself with no good reason if you, if you use this type of function on, on in a Windows FFI. <laughs> yeah. And that's the first part of my talk, actually. So I was thinking we might take a small break for some coffee or something. That's probably not here yet, but... And then afterwards, I'm going to talk a bit about optimization. If there's any questions, by the way. Any questions about encodings? Something you, you haven't quite gotten that you might need to know. Yeah. <laughs> Always nice early in the morning. Any questions? How, 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 how do you deal with encodings in Faro or Squeak in a good and organized manner? I mean, I've tried to show you now, but if there's anything that's unclear, then please, please tell me. OK, let's break. <laughs> That was...